This is Shane Harper from Good Luck Charlie and God's Not Dead, and you're watching Dispatch Radio. All right, folks, we have a great actor on with us now. Peter Amari is going to talk to us about a TV series, Love, Hate, which is on Netflix. So he's got some upcoming films to talk about. And, folks, you may know him from Band of Brothers, but, man, some great roles that are coming his way. Uh, great to talk to you. How are you, Peter? Good. Very well, Brandon. Thank you so much for, for talking with me. And now, Peter, you have a very kind of odd world that you play in on a show, Love, Hate, and it is uh, <laughs> uh, drug trafficking, prostitution. I mean, not exactly a kid's show, I'm assuming. Certainly not a kid's show, uh, but it is <laughs> yeah. Ireland's uh, highest rated drama, and I would say it's going to be its most successful uh, the, uh, export. And so I would highly encourage people who enjoy the world of uh, uh, the underworld drug world and drama. If you like The Sopranos, if you like The Wire, check out Love Hate. It's on Netflix. And w what is your character, and how does he kind of fit into this sort of, you know, sordid universe? So the story is about the sort of gangland culture. It's a lot of it's based on uh, the very real events that are happening uh, in Ireland. Ireland is a small island um, into which uh, it, there's been a lot of influx of the, all the, the worst kind of elements, you know, the drugs, the um, and the, the things that hurt people's lives. And there are then the, the gangland culture people thrive off, uh, you know, the, the suffering of others. Um, and But, of course, like every gang, they have their own code of conduct and their own sort of omerta, if you like. Um, it's set in Dublin. It's set pretty much on the north side of Dublin, the poorer parts of Dublin. And the main story revolves, revolves around, uh, in season one, it revolves around a, a gang drug lord called uh, John Boy, played by Aidan Gillen, who you'll know from Game of Thrones. And then as we move on through the seasons, there are now four seasons, um, they, we move on to a character called Nidge, and he becomes the, the kingpin. And uh, the world is one of revenge and greed and fear, uh, and it's told brilliantly by the writing of the creator, um, Stuart Carlin, and it's directed by David Caffrey. And all of them are Irish Sounds like a really, really great uh, crime drama that, folks, you know, you love this kind of stuff. You're going to enjoy this one as well. And, you know, Peter, what kind of pulled you into this role? What, what, what is it that drives you as, as you play this uh, this dentist who's now oh, you know, oh, caught yes, up in right, this yes. world? So I'm a dentist. I'm the middle class person who's caught up in this world. This is something that genuinely happens, actually, with the criminal element. As often they find someone who's of a, let's say, normal middle-class background, and they lure them into the underworld, and they use them as a front for their uh, operations. So I play a, a dentist called Andrew, who um, has a bit of a taste for prostitutes and cocaine and ends up running up a large tab with the gang and they're in their illicit brothel. And uh, he can't pay them. He's in debt. Uh, a lot of people in Ireland are suffering from debt. I mean, I think that's a global issue, something everybody can recognize. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of credit card problems out there. So anyway, he ends up financially compromised, and the only way that he can pay them back is to help them import um, illegal amounts of, huge amounts of this drug, lidocaine. Lidocaine is used as a mixing agent in cocaine. Um, and... Uh, so he uh, he is able to import it because he's a medical professional. I think it's and, such a uh, great I think it's such a great topic. We we deal with uh, I mean obviously here in Florida we have a pill mill issue that's so out of control. People talk about it all the time, but you know doctors and dentists and nurses get themselves into these basically what you're saying like this character he's like he's trapped because of his debt. So now he's basically he's got to push whatever these guys are telling him to push. You got to move this. You got to move that. You got to do this because you're indebted to them. Oh, totally, yeah. And everything is suffering. His marriage is broken up. And so so we, we glimpse into his, his um, other life. Uh, he has a wife and kids, and they, you know, he's run up so much debt, he can't pay for the schools, and the house is going to be mortgaged. But then there's the public face of that. You know, you've got to keep up your status. The wife is very concerned that they, um, you know, if the kids need to move to school, we need to do it now. And, of course, where you send your kids to school is such a public uh, display of, you know, your sort of self-worth, uh, your status socially. And so all of that, he's dealing with, you know, he's, he's about to lose all that. And so he's clinging on, he's hanging on to whatever he can, and he's desperate. He's a, he's a very sort of desperate and pathetic figure caught between 
the gang um, who are who have him, and then, well, as we will see, a very smart police element sort of get wise and start to move in. Fantastic. Um, that, that takes us into season five, which is shooting right now. Your uh, next film, or well, you have two that are coming. I'm not sure which one's going to land first, right? Traitors and uh, The Beautiful Ones. And let me start with Traitors because you have just great co-stars. Obviously, Killian Scott's on Love, Hate with You Now. And then, of mm-hmm. course, John Bradley from Game of Thrones. And tell everybody a little bit about Traitors and what they're going to expect to see. It's, um, it is, in a nutshell, it's sort of like Fight Club meets... Um, I don't know, something, something set in the future. Uh, it is, you know, the people are, are so desperate for money and that, that we have this economic meltdown and people are being laid off work. What if, what if you were able to fight to the death to earn money? You know, what if it went that far? And uh, that's, that's pretty much the premise of the, of the piece. Fight Club meets Running Man. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's good. All right. We'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll roll with that. And of course... You know, the resume keeps building. Peter, people might think there's a theme here, because Beautiful Ones is kind of another crime drama as well, but, uh, you know, a little, a little bit different. Tell the folks about that one. A little, yeah, another, another crime drama. That's um, my friend Ross McCall, who you'll know from uh, from uh, Band of Brothers as well. We're both in Band of Brothers. Um, that is another crime drama. Uh, set again in the underworld. I don't know why I'm spending so much time in this particular genre, but uh, it's an action thriller, and uh, that is in, in post at the moment, and it's directed by Jesse Johnson, who has brought you many good action pictures, Pitbull among them. Um, I, I highly recommend waiting for it to come out. I don't have the release, actually, to mind. I don't know when it's going to be available. But uh, again, that's uh, fast cars, fast women, fast lives, lots of guns in action. It's good. <laughs> I love it. Fast cars, fast action, women. That's great. That's great. That's, that's, that's perfect. It's a good thing to about. And, it, it, and, and, it, and the folks, the film's called The Beautiful Ones. That's fantastic. It's called The Beautiful Ones, yes. Um, <laughs> it's quite the metaphor of our society. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The uh, Band of Brothers, of course, is, is still very uh, prevalent in our um in, in the culture, and um, it's still very relevant. I think it's a, a piece I'm very proud to have been associated with. This is the 70th anniversary of the uh, Normandy landings, and there will be a uh, special um, memorial and celebration, if you like, uh, in on the beaches of Normandy this summer uh, in June. And we will be unveiling a statue to Major Dick Winters mm. and uh, remembering the, the landing of Easy Company. Uh, on that fateful day. And uh, Band of Brothers is something that people, I think, still respond so positively toward. It was an amazing thing to be part of. While we shot it, we had, none of us had any idea how it would all turn out. And it really is lightning in a bottle. And it's such a powerful piece of work. And it's one that I, when I look at, I completely forget that I was involved in. You know, I'm, able to, I'm totally drawn to the story and of those very real heroes. And I've had the great fortune to meet them. Um, and there's such, you know, here's the incredible thing, is these guys are in their 80s, and they're so full of life, they're so alive, they're so positive, they're so engaged, they're engaged in their grandchildren, they want to know what app you're using, they want to, you know, they're still so with it, and uh, that's incredible. I find it, it's actually, we don't see enough maybe of the third generation in our popular television culture. Uh, these guys really, I learn from them, because uh, meeting them, you think, that's who I want to be, that's what I want to be like when, I'm, when I get to be. 86, 87. And that's why they're called the greatest generation, in my opinion. But uh, let me let me stay on Band of Brothers for a minute. So at what point in the process do you start to realize, to, to use your word, lightning in a bottle, that you're part of something that's like, man, this is really something special? I, I, it certainly had a feeling of something special when we sh- shot it, like going to work every day and putting on a uniform, and we were, you know, we drilled and marched, and you take yourself mentally back to 1943 and the values of that time and what that experience must have been like. And uh, that sense of brotherhood, obviously, um, but also the sense of doing something not just for your nation, but something that globally really needed to to be done and all the risks that were involved. And the kind of uh, I suppose resilience that they, I mean, they saw so much things that we can't even imagine, you know, um, 
the horrors that they saw, and yet just that grim determination to get through. It's a great American attribute. It is a real American quality that no matter how bad things get, America rises up and pushes forward, always takes the hill, always, always goes, you know, will not stop until uh, the objective is achieved. And I think that's, that's um, one of the reasons why, I mean, I grew up in Ireland, in Tipperary, the wild rolling hills, and as a boy, all I wanted to do was play soldiers and be in a, being an American GI. And then I got to, I got to do it, and so I feel very blessed. Oh, yeah, Special you're... on the day I'm... Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I think that's why the legacy of this, this band of brothers is so great. I mean, it just, it's so... You, 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 you know, as, you know, growing up with my grandfather and, and having relatives that we lost in that war, it kind of helps capture and connect you to the, the family you didn't get to meet. It helps you understand what people did for you and your, your grandparents or your uncles and, and stuff. That's what they did. And it's like, it, it kind of helps us understand that, or at least try to give it some, uh, gravitas, so to speak. Sure. Yeah. It's a, it is definitely something to feel, very proud of, you know, it's, uh, it really is. And uh, what a great contribution um, that America has made to the world. Uh, and, and that obviously being a, a very pivotal one. I was just in Palm Springs. If anyone is ever visiting Palm Springs, I can highly recommend a visit to the Palm Springs Air Museum, which has an amazing collection of World War II aircraft in pristine condition. They've got a B-17 that you can get in and walk around and have a look. And as you sit in it, um, you know, it took 10 guys. Uh, there were 10 guys in there, the gunners, radio men, pilots, and they were just going up in this flimsy piece of tin flying over Germany and just, or, and, and later on in the Pacific, those are the sort of B-24s. But uh, it's kind of incredible. It's, it's sort of amazing. And they were so young. They were so young. They were in their teens and early 20s. And they just did it, you know. It's, uh, you get a sense when you go, when I go to a museum, when I go to places like that, I, I really like to connect with what it must have felt like. Well, and rightfully so. So, Peter, let me ask about, you know, you started out with a, you know, on stage and did a lot of stage work. I think you even had ties to the same place where Liam Neeson came from. But do you miss a little bit of stage work? Do you still try to mix that in a little bit? Or, or how, how does that fit into your schedule now? Uh, it's a good question, Brad, and I do miss the stage, actually. There's something nice about it just being an audience and the writing and the actor. Um, on a TV set and in film, you have so many different elements. It's very technical, and uh, there's a lot of pe things that, there's a lot of things that you, the actor, can't control, and even, you know, even down to the edit. So you are kind of at the whim back to the lightning in a bottle thing, you just hope that everything works out, you know, that everybody's showing up and everyone's on the same page and everybody has the same idea and everyone's trying to achieve the same goal. And that that doesn't happen that often, actually. You know, think of the great dramas that we've had, um, particularly in American television over the last few years. You could kind of list them all on one hand. I mean, The Sopranos would be one, Breaking Bad would be the other. That's just off the top of my head. It, it takes a lot of People, everyone has to be kind of speaking the same language and taking on the same, uh, or moving rather with the same uh, goal and objective in mind. Um, in theater, that's a little easier because you don't have so many technical uh, bells and whistles to uh, to, to deal with. Um, I started at the Lyric Theater in Belfast, which was indeed uh, where Liam Neeson began as well. And I played a very famous role that he had previously played, um, which there's an Irish writer called Brian Friel. People may know he wrote a famous play called Dancing at Lunasa. He also has a, a play called uh, Philadelphia, Here I Come, which is about a boy who's about to leave Ireland and go to live with his cousins in, in Philadelphia. And in this period, when the play is set, that would mean emigrating. You would never really be coming back to Ireland. And so there's a public side to him, and then there's the, his private imagination. He's imagining what it would be like in America, what will his new life be like, and he can't wait to leave Ireland. And yet the thing he wants most is a real connection with his father, who is very um, cold and sort of standoffish. And that's the one he wants more than going to America is to be able to connect with his father properly. And so Liam Neeson had played this very private part, the sort of imagination character, and then I played it uh, some years later. And uh, so I'm sort of treading in his footsteps. He's now on the board of the Lyric Theatre Belfast. It's a wonderful place, and Kenneth Branagh just recently did a play there. And uh, so it's, you know, things are good on the theatre scene in Ireland. 
Um, but yes, I miss the stage, and it would be nice to go back there. And you know, who knows? Maybe we'll, we'll do something soon. Hey, you never know. You never know. So we've been talking to Peter Omer- Amara. Oh, I almost said it wrong. Peter Omar. Almost got it Amira wrong. Amira Omara, whatever. Amira Amara. That's uh, you know. Come on, I got I got to get it right. Om- Amara. Omara. Omar, my, my, Omara. My my, Yan- <laughs> my Yankee showing. So I got to get get it in gear. But I really I'm just do. Covering baseball. So. Well, you know, hey, you know, we're going to rub off on you as much as you can rub off on us. So we've got to check out Absolutely, this uh, man. Love, love, Hate. It's on Netflix, folks. So you can get caught up there on Season 5. It is uh, definitely a high crime drama that you would enjoy very much if you like those kinds of things. He mentioned Sopranos. That's a very, very good analogy. But we also got some good stuff coming out called The Traders, The Beautiful Ones. We'll try to link to some of that stuff, folks, give you some trailers to look at, that kind of thing. You can catch Peter on screen. So thank you so much again for fitness into your busy schedule, sir. Brandon, what a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. All right, take care.